Good morning, good morning everybody, and I'm so happy to see so many people in the room. We've never done this kind of, of meetings before, and maybe I, we scared you yesterday and the day before with so long meetings and you were tired, but fantastic, I'm so happy. Uh, as I said in my presentation the other day, uh, we have asked the NOCs what do you want uh, ANOC to do, and especially with the General Assemblies, as they are normally very long meetings and a lot of reports. And uh, you answered uh, we want some more interactive uh, debates, discussions, and we can talk about important topics that is going on at the moment in the Olympic movement. So that's what we did. We were looking at what is uh, for everybody a big uh, thing to discuss today and important things. And we have chosen then two topics. And uh, as everybody else, we are talking about sustainability in sport. And uh, the first session here for uh, one hour will be moderated by Demian Foxel. The panelists, we have asked some of our members, the NOCs, to be in the panel. So we have Leonardo Cunha, Sustainability Manager of the NOC of Cop World. Welcome. We have uh, Tricia Smith, the President of the NOC of Canada. <laughs> and also we have an expert with Stephanie Gerritsen. She's the Campaign Coordinator of UN Clean Seas. So, very welcome, and I uh, give the floor to Mr. Foxell. Thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary General, Madam Lindbergh. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. The ANOC and the NOC network. Monsieur, Madame, bonjour. And if I will try in Korean, annyeong haseyo. Uh, to kick off this first theme session this morning, sustainability in sport. And I think I may be biased, but I think it probably is one of the most important topics uh, of this whole conference. But hopefully, if you don't agree, we can persuade you. So uh, let's have some fun today. And so to start with, I would like to explore the room and see if we have any superheroes. So hands up, please. This is not a time to be humble. Uh, I want to see a row of hands. Have we any African superheroes in the room? Yes, I knew we would. Any Asian superheroes? Keep your hands up, please. European, Oceania, who have I missed? The Americas, Americas, thank you. And of course, last but not least, do we have any Korean superheroes in the room today? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, of course, because we believe in sport and the power of sport, we are all superheroes. I used to be a superhero. I would say goodbye to the kids and leave homes at strange times in the day or night with a bag full of cool stuff. Sailing gear, broken knives, you know, sailing gear, knives, sailing knives and tape and stuff that I needed to go offshore and compete offshore. And sometimes I'd leave for weeks or months on end, but I'd come back smelling of the high seas and with stories of icebergs and near misses and successes and some, and some failures on the high seas. And sometimes I'd even come back with the trophy. In this time, I've competed in more than six round-the-world events and compiled enough miles to have sailed to the moon and back. I had to explain to my daughter it was not actually to the moon and back. Um, in this time, I became a superhero, at least in their eyes. But kids grow up and they learn, and as they learn about and ask questions about the world, they start to ask us questions. And in the last 50 years, and if you haven't guessed, it's approximately my age, 
we've lost 70% of our wildlife biomass. We have 25% more carbon dioxide in the air we're breathing right now than we did 50 years ago. The last time there was this much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, there were forests in Antarctica. It's pretty mind-blowing stuff. Um, and so over the last 50 years, we've really been on autopilot, I would say, going too fast in the wrong direction. My name is Damien Foxall. I'm Sustainability Program Manager for the 11th Hour Racing Team. We're supported by our primary sponsor, 11th Hour Racing, which is a philanthropic organization that promotes sustainability through the power of sport. We're a professional sailing team entered in currently what is the pinnacle of our sport, the ocean race. The ocean race is the longest event in any sport. And the next edition of the race, which starts this January from Alicante, uh, will be upwards of six months long. This is the third ocean race for our team. And by placing sustainability at the core, we have created a loyal group of stakeholders with us, that have supported the team both on and off the water. Sustainability has become a crucial part of our DNA to the extent that without it, we wouldn't exist. And by placing sustainability at the core, we have created a, lo we have created a loyal group of stakeholders which has maintained sustainable funding and support across three ocean race campaigns and has allowed us to assign a dedicated team to, to, and resources to identify the issues and the key material issues that, we've been, that, that, that relate to our operation and our sport. I'm just going to give you a few examples. Over the last couple of years, we've built a brand new race boat for our event, 60 feet long. 34 tons of material were used to build a nine-ton boat. The rest was waste or resource to be recovered. So we did a full LCA assessment of, from the design uh, of the boat to actually the launch of the boat, and that has built a brand new benchmark for our industry, which is going to indicate direction of how, to we, how we can do better in the future to, get, to provide a decarbonization pathway for our sport, and most importantly, within our class, how we can embed better rules in the equipment. Looking at the material itself, we've initiated a carbon recycling program with our local marine industry and in fact with our, the other teams and competitors as well. Uh, these are just two examples, but underpinning all of this, you know, credibility is one of the cornerstones of sustainability and it was very important for us to be very early signatories to the climate action framework, which you were all signing up to as well, and to be active members of this community. This is just a small snapshot of what we've been doing as a team. Um, but of course, sustainability requires dedicated action on a whole matrix of issues which relate to us all. And so recognizing these challenges, we founded the Toolbox, which is an open access framework that allows any organization from any sector to implement a sustainability program. And Isaac, thank you for presenting that so well yesterday. Uh, specifically, we've mapped the whole UNFCCC process uh, to the toolbox and it's, uh, it's available on the Creative Commons and it's available for free. I'd like to take the opportunity to, to say thank you very much to all of you, to ANOC. You have contributed to translating the toolbox and those assets into a third language, so it now is, exists in English, French and Spanish, and we welcome more requests. Uh, for further languages, but most importantly, we welcome all of you to the Toolbox community and thank you to have us here. As I left home to come here the other day, my daughter saw my bags and asked me, Dad, are you going racing again? Now, she knows the answer to this question, but um, I engaged her and said no. You know my job, it's to save the world and to look after the health of our oceans. She stood at me and looked and goes, well, Dad, you're not doing a very good job. And then she kind of headed off to her room, but before she closed her door and I wasn't going to be outdone by my teenage daughter, I said, but the good news is I'm going to go and see a group of amazing people 
and they're all superheroes, and they're going to help us. And so I have for, for you a very special message this morning from my daughter. We need you to consider how to embed sustainability within your sector and within your sport, and to look left and right, and to learn from your neighbors, and to use the power of your group to embed sustainability locally, regionally, and nationally. And so as I leave you to reflect on this very special request, uh, maybe we can get some insp inspiration from our panelists. So um, it's a brave new world, so I think Leonardo is going to go first. And um, then we'll uh, follow on from there. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Leonardo Cunha, and I come from uh, a very beautiful place named Cape Verde. So for the people that are present in here, I would like just to start to ask you all to close your eyes, please. Please close your eyes. If you are seeing, you're cheating. Everybody has to close your eyes. Close your eyes, OK? So closing your eyes, you're going to imagine beautiful beach. Can you imagine a beautiful beach? OK. See the clean water, the blue clean water, and the sand of the beach, really yellow, the white sand, actually. Can you see that, that beach? Very beautiful. OK, you can open up your eyes. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm the best travel agency in the world. You just went to Cape Verde and came back here, so paradise is just how Cape Verde is. So my name is Leonardo. I came from Cape Verde Island, a small nation island, and uh, we just went to my country really quick. But as Damien just said, you're all superheroes. I want you to start to share with each other your superpowers. And for that, we are going to share your Olympic power. So everybody stand up, please. And let's everybody share good energy and give uh, Olympic high five. Everybody, Olympic high five. Olympic high five. Do you feel the energy? Very good, very good. Awesome. OK, my dear friends. So what I would uh, like to present to you and my challenge is, as you know, and I just presented, I come from a small NOC uh, on a small island nation. And that could be a really good excuse to say that we don't have the means, we don't have the the, the, the resources enough to start a st sustainability plan and start our actions associated to sustainability. But actually, as Damien just uh, told us, this is an urgent matter. So it's something that everybody must come along, uh, must unite behind a good cause that uh, is the protection of our planet and to uh, be able to have a sustainable planet for next generations. And sports, it deals with emotions. It deals with uh, behavioral change. So it's even within your power to cause this behavioral change, even if you are doing small steps at a time. So what I'm going to bring out here is our experience. It's not good, it's not bad, it's what we were able to do, and hopefully I can inspire you to also take action. Gustavo, please time me, OK? <laughs> OK, so uh, first of all, I would like to just point out some of the actions that we started to do. I started, I was invited by my mentor, Madam President uh, Philomena Forge, to work with her in 2015. And one of our first big uh, projects over on our NOC was called, it was a project called Verde Olympics. So Verde in Portuguese means green. And this is Verde Olympics, also for Cape Verde. It's a, uh, it was a program just for uh, leadership education and youth empowerment. But what we did in the end was uh, using the, sport, the sports as an empowerment tool and to construct our 
sports materials made out of garbage. As you can imagine, if you come from a country that lacks all of resources, sometimes you don't have sport equipment. So what we did is we empowered the youth to be uh, actually really original, take up the materials that they could find anywhere and actually build up their materials. It was a huge success. We could uh, uh, train and capacitate more than 300 youngsters, more than 6,000 children participated on the program, and it became a case study for the IOC. So we were really happy for this case study. So afterwards, we heard of the opportunity of joining the Sports for Climate Action, actually, and then we made the commitment of starting our actions to reduce our carbon footprint alongside our umbrella organizations, the commitment that the IOC and the Olympic movement were getting uh, ahead. So we had some challenges um, on how to do that, how to kickstart that. So our big bet was Let's try to learn with best practices. Let's start to learn with each other. So Julie Drifus, who was presented to you by Niels, uh, was one of the focal points that we reached out for us just to help out and uh, uh, um, give us some pointers where we could start. And from that point on, and with Olympic solidarity support, we were able to uh, address with a consultant to uh, give us some pointers where we could also start get expert, uh, expert help on our tests associated with sustainability. Then, uh, in uh, the construction of our strategic plan, we uh, had the vision of having our uh, own headquarters. This opportunity came uh, from uh, uh, a wish within the organization, but also from the opportunity that ANOCA, our continental association, gave it to us. So they have a special program for the NOCs that don't have an headquarters to build their own headquarters. We are very grateful for ANOCA for the effort they, they did to support, and we made the plan of construction our new headquarters based on that program. But we tried to have a big step ahead. So if we are going to build our own headquarters, probably we will try to solve scope one and scope two right ahead and try to build it on a different way. So for that, we tried to bring the concept of a new headquarters based on social impact and local development, infrastructure concept, local legacy and sustainability. What I want to mean with this is for the, 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 the first uh, area, we did a priority assessment, and what we believed is if we are going to construct our new headquarters, probably the best way is to be constructed with the local community where it's going to be constructed. So uh, as you can see in the image, people are constructing their own, uh, the, they, they are constructing a, a, a wall, and the wall is made out of garbage. Actually, uh, the concept of our uh, headquarters is to be built with more than 60% of recycled materials. Do it, doing it out of tires that is going to be recycled, our, out of bottles, uh, glass bottles, also, also aluminum cans, and by using these materials, we will be also reducing uh, the, the existing garbage that is on, uh, abundant on our city, and also engage the population to be employed, because the people that are going to build our headquarters are people unemployed on the local area. Also empower them with new knowledge. How can you all even build your own house out of materials that are considered garbage? And also get the community involvement. They will be uh, using the headquarters that they really uh, helped to build uh, uh, alongside it and also help the environment. This is the 4E approach. So, the concept of the building is to be a carbon neutral building, actually, off the grid building. This means that you will produce their own electricity, will uh, we'll uh, we'll be able to, to uh, guarantee the water from the rain and recycle the water as well, uh, and be uh, not dependent of anything that is on grid to be uh, off grid. And uh, as some properties, even you can have a small uh, 
uh, um, you can you can build you can grow your own food within the headquarters because the the the, the farming field will also fi filtrate the water that you are using. So this is the aspect of uh, the the building. If you are familiar, the concept comes from Michael Reynolds. is a uh, earth ship. So look it up. Uh, I'll be able to share more information on it. It will be the first. Uh, facility that I know dedicated for, uh, for sports that are built on this way and we are uh, building up uh, uh, using the concept of this uh, construction method. So in the end what we want to do is also to create legacy programs, local impact, uh, using uh, not only the opportunities that uh, Olymp Africa Foundation uh, offer us with uh, our local cl uh, club but also engage the population on activities on environmental ed education and be able to uh, get the local community behind this, this, this cause. So we uh, had our first institutional support from the IOC. We presented this, uh, this program uh, to uh, our IOC president that embraced it. He wants to support this program. We have been uh, in talks with uh, the IOC to make this uh, as an example for other organizations under the Olympic movement and also other partners that are engaged with us uh, to deliver it uh, and to have a, a sustainable product in the end. So the message is this, together we can. Uh, we have a word in Cape Verdean that is Juntamo. Juntamo is hold hands. So we truly believe if we work with our community, the, the, pro the final product of constructing our headquarters will be plus and surplus of even on constructing only a building. And that's it. That's our context. And Gustavo went away, so I passed the 10 minutes for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Obrigado, Leonardo. Um, it's really inspiring because it's such a great blend of action, education, and opportunity for your community. And actually, when we think about sustainability, I think we all need to consider it's not a new concept. It goes back generations. It talks about what already exists. It talks about our traditions, our culture, and resilience. And so uh, that's a great inspirational story, Leonardo. Um, Tricia, you're up next. Would you like to share the scale of the Canadian NOC, what you guys are doing? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be in a room with so many superheroes. And I just want you to close your eyes. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> close your eyes. So. So thank you for having me today to talk about this most important topic. And uh, climate change, it's been described as the biggest threat to humanity. We're certainly seeing the effects every day. You look in the news, uh, melting glaciers and flooded rivers and dry lakes and intense heat and poor air quality. The places we, the people responsible for the Olympic movement in 206 nations where we live and work and play, they're changing in ways that put billions of human lives and countless species at risk, as we heard about. And if we're not part of the solution, then we're part of the problem. And we know sport has a significant carbon footprint. We therefore not only have the responsibility to address this, but I think we have an opportunity to be forward thinking and really inspire the world to take action. We can really make a difference. So in terms of the Canadian Olympic Committee, what's the goal of the Canadian Olympic Committee climate action strategy? And to be clear, I'm not an expert in this, in it, but it's pretty straightforward. It's, it's, it's common sense, different levels of common sense. To make a significant contribution to this huge goal of positive climate action, we believe you have to start in your own backyard. So our initial goal to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions in our own backyard, and we have two approaches. One is to address our own organization by taking steps within our own organization, making thoughtful, logical choices to curb our emissions as an organization. And the second approach is to support our athletes. Our athletes are the heart of the Olympic movement and some of the most influential people in our countries and worldwide, and so we're working to support the power of the athlete voice to inspire change and tell their stories. 
So improve our own organization and then support our athletes to inspire change. So with regard to our own organization, first of all, you had to we have to determine where would we start from. And we're really at the beginning stages. Just a few years ago, we, we started then with our, our measurement um, to understand our carbon footprint. We, ha we are fortunate to have a partner with Deloitte. So we worked with the sustainability experts at our partner Deloitte using their uh, GHG protocol, corporate reporting and accounting standard to measure our carbon footprint. And using this standard, they measure everything the COC is doing from our business operations, our games footprint, and as you can imagine, most of our carbon footprint is related to purchased good and goods and services, air travel, commuting, and other fuel and energy related activities. So obviously once we understood what we were doing, we needed a framework then for our path forward. And we signed on to the United Nations Sport for Climate Action Framework. And the goal of the framework is really to lay out a path for the global sport community to combat climate change through commitments and partnership. And then the next step, of course, is following that framework. And we joined with our partners. We took such steps as um, with, the, um, with the postponement of the games, we had a lot of food and uh, equipment, beverages and so on from the games. We donated all that to a local food bank. Uh, we also worked for our uh, towards having our Toronto office be certified as LEED Platinum and BOMA Best Platinum for our sustainability standards. And we joined and followed the United, uh, United Nations Sports for Climate Action Framework. As a and as a result of all of the, this work, we were one of the five National Olympic Committee recipients of the IOC Dow Carbon uh, Award in 2020, which resulted in an offsetting of our emissions for 2020 and being considered carbon neutral for that year. Those two initiatives of the food donation and certifying our office were specifically recognized in receiving these awards. With those awards, though, we're also expected to present detailed data on our carbon reduction plans. And again, we work with Deloitte on that. But as we heard yesterday, um, there are not everyone has Deloitte as a partner. We get that. But there are other opportunities through this organization, through the IOC, to, uh, to address those uh, areas where you might not have the resources. So this year, we also committed to a program called Race to Zero, which I'll talk about in a minute. And our targets are now more specific, and that's to reduce our carbon emissions by 50% by 2030 as a minimum, and just to get to a net zero emission by 2040. And we're now at the step of building our action plan on how we intend to achieve those targets, and we're engaging with our staff. In fact, we've identified a staff who has sustainability as part of their portfolio. We uh, talked to our partners and members. We started with an education strategy uh, for, to understand our footprint and where we go from there. Education, of course, is so important so that we understand what we're trying to achieve and how we can all pull in the same direction. We're also working with the Canadian sport community. Our membership are all our national sport federations. I'm sure it's very similar for you to reimagine how we work to choose Zoom meetings instead of uh, flying. We have a big country like many of you and uh, uh, the meetings were um, getting to be incredible. And um, with the uh, opportunity to try out Zoom and those similar kinds of meetings through COVID, uh, it gives you an opportunity to make a simple change and, make, uh, and, and yet have a big impact. We're also looking at more sustainable ways to equip our teams to recycle equipment and clothing, to donate products and, and supplies left over from previous Olympic Games, to find ways to incentivize our members to cut their emissions, and to work with you to, to learn from you in sessions like this. Uh, in terms of um, the second approach, which is amplifying our athletes' voices, and supporting the, that strategy of influ influence. There are many Olympians in Canada and outside of Canada we know who are passionate about giving back to their communities and leading, leaving a lasting legacy. And I'd like to share the story of, stories of just two of those athletes, um, of the many who are working in this area. First is Shay Smith, who's working on this project that I mentioned, Racing to Zero. He's a two-time uh, summer and winter Olympian, and he has just been appointed to the IOC uh, Athletes Com uh, Committee. And he founded Racing to Zero with a team of four other Canadian Olympians 
The goal is to create a grassroots sport community equipped with the tools to tackle climate change. Through uh, the Canadian Olympic Committee uh, Olympic Legacy Grant, we provided Shea with funding to help with this project. It provides uh, organizations with sustainability education and sustainability audits to help them understand their carbon footprint. It also helps support developing carbon improvement projects. Something just as simple as at a, um, a track event, having a mobile drinking fountain at, at all the local track meets, uh, and that has been purchased to uh, uh, ultimately reduce the reliance on single-use plastic. So really simple things that can make a huge difference, especially in a big country where you're having thousands of events every year. Uh, and another athlete who's working in this area is Marianne Tenno. She's a Canadian freestyle skier, and she's training uh, to hopefully return to the next Winter Olympic Games. And with the, her goal is being one of Canada's first carbon-neutral athletes. So that's her personal goal. She's currently partnering with a Canadian company using their expertise to help her find solutions. And she's at the beginning stage of this project, but it's simple things like starting small, uh, setting up a process to donate all of her equipment instead of it going into the landfill, traveling on foot wherever possible during the competitions. So simple things. It doesn't have to be complicated. And her intention, as I said, is to be carbon neutral by the next, next games. We also have a group of engaged Olympians who are supporting a green sports day in Canada and, again, having an influence on our government and, and our, in our community. So really, it's, it's to conclude, sometimes mitigating climate change can feel like it's just too big. And uh, too big, and there's nothing you can do. But every st small step, if we look after our own backyards and everyone do th does that, just think of the impact we can have with our Olympic family of 206 nations around the world. Stronger Together has never been more meaningful and important. So thank you very much. Thank you, Tricia. Thank you. Thank you, Tricia. Yeah, I mean, clearly when you think about the Canadian NOC, the questions I have are challenges of scale and the fact that, you know, sustainability is a, such a matrix of issues that we have to address. You know, where do you start? But then, you know, we mustn't let complexity and the scale of the challenge be the barrier to action, and, and that's just spot on. Uh, you know, whatever scale you're working at, take the first step, and the next one will follow. So, Stephanie, over to you, um, because we have other tools that are availability in other programs, so really exciting to learn about the UN and Clean Seas program. Good morning. Uh, this is such an honor to be here uh, representing the UN Environment Program out of the Nairobi headquarters. And as a two-sport athlete in college in the U.S., it's truly an honor to really link sustainable development, uh, environmentalism, and sport. So we are facing a triple planetary crisis. It includes climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution, which is fueled by unsustainable production and consumption patterns, which is putting our world's economic and social well-being at risk, and it's undermining the opportunities to reduce poverty and improve our lives and livelihoods. Tackling it calls for a stronger, more agile, innovative, and forward-looking presence. And when we're talking about the triple planetary crisis, we're also looking towards a pollution-free planet. It's all very interconnected with one another. And transitioning to a pollution-free world is the best insurance policy for our future generations, for our children and for our athletes, as it improves the ec ecosystem integrity that they need for survival. Our planet is literally choking on plastic. Over 400 million tons of plastic is produced every year. Our oceans and waterways have become dumping grounds and transformed into essentially what is plastic soup. The convenience of plastic in our everyday lives is and its relative cheapness has resulted in our planet's most greatest, or greatest environmental challenge. In cities around the world, plastic waste clogs drains, it causes a lot of floods and disease. 
Exposure to plastics can harm human health and our athletes' health, potentially affecting fertility, hormonal, metabolic, and neurological activity. And open burning sites of plastics contributes to air pollution as well, which obviously affects our athletes' lung capacity. In addition, more than 800 marine and coastal species are affected by plastic pollution through ingestion, entanglement, and other dangers. This means it ends up in our food chain, and this is what we're feeding our athletes. Plastic pollution is not a new problem. Since 1950, approximately 7 billion tons of plastic have become waste, three quarters of which have ended up in landfills or dumped in our environment. Less than 10 percent of all plastic ever produced is recycled. This is because most countries do not have the appropriate waste management systems to deal with this plastic. Plastic pollution is also a global problem. Plastic is a transboundary issue. Anything that is dumped from the global north is inevitably going to take up, wash up ashore. In the global south, 11 million tons of plastic flows into our oceans every year. This essentially means that every minute, the equivalent of one garbage truck of plastic is dumped into our ocean. That is every minute. Without action, this is projected to nearly triple by 2040. Plastic pollution directly affects millions of people's livelihoods, food production capabilities. And social well-being. We're also talking a lot about climate change. Plastic pollution is a climate problem. Plastic pollution can alter habitats and natural processes, and reduce ecosystems' ability to adapt to climate change. We are talking a lot about greenhouse emissions. So, green gas emissions from the production, recycling, and disposables of plastics can account for 19%. Of the Paris Climate Agreement's total allowable emissions in 2040, plastic pollution is also a biodiversity problem. Coral reefs, one of the world's most diverse ecosystems, are impacted by plastic pollution and microplastics, reducing their ability to adapt to climate change as well. This also affects all of the marine life, killing them because they are literally. Unable to breathe underwater. This can also significantly impact nations whose entire GDP depends on travel and tourism. If there aren't any more fish or coral reefs to snorkel around and see, then the tourists will no longer be coming if no concerted action is taken. Plastic pollution has grown into an epidemic. Plastic packaging accounts for nearly half of all plastic waste globally, and much of it is thrown away just within a few seconds of use. Most plastic is single-use, but that doesn't mean it's easily disposable. Plastic is an epidemic that can last a very long time in very remote places without urgent action. When plastic is discarded in landfills or in the environment, it can last up to a thousand years to decompose. This gets decomposed into little particles called microplastics, and they can enter all of our different waterways, including rivers, lakes, wetlands, and mangroves. Microplastics can also be manufactured on purpose into microbeads, and these microbeads can be found in common household products such as face wash, toothpaste, and makeup. They are also found in everyday clothing. So, and also athletic uniforms,、um, which are made out of plastic, tiny, pl- tiny little plastic threads. So, the pervasiveness of plastics and microbeads and microplastics—they can be found in the most remote places on Earth, including the Arctic. So, tackling one of the most envir- greatest environmental challenges will require governments to regulate, businesses to innovate, and individuals to act. And for this reason, the Clean Seas Campaign was. Um, activated to create, create greater attention and awareness of the issue and the relationship to the triple planetary crisis. So the Clean Seas Campaign is a UN environment initiative, and it's a broad-based, global, public-facing campaign that addresses the issue of plastic waste 
entering our world's lakes, rivers, and ocean, and to win meaningful action from governments, the private sector, and civil society, as well as individuals in turning the tide against plastic. 69 member states have so far joined the Clean Seas Campaign, and it represents 76% of our world's coastline. We also have over 115,000 citizens that have pledged to reduce their own plastic footprint. Most recently, we, the UN has achieved a historic milestone. At UNEA, the UN Environmental Assembly 5.2, it's the world's highest level decision making body on the environment. They passed a historic resolution to end plastic pollution, addressing the entire life cycle of plastic from source to sea. The goal is by 2024, UN member states will have committed to a globally, legally binding treaty to end plastic pollution. This treaty is to create an enabling environment for new regulations on addressing plastic pollution that all member states can feasibly achieve. So the purpose of the Clean Seas Campaign, which is a, UN, a flagship UN campaign, is to shift towards substantial upstream actions in the fight against marine litter and plastic pollution, improve industrial plastic management, phase out non-recoverable plastics, so this is the microplastics uh, that are found in common household products, and reduce this use of single-use plastic. So by adopting a source to sea approach, the Clean Seas Campaign is has extended its focus from just eliminating problematic single-use plastic products to discussing and educating more broadly on unnecessary, avoidable, and harmful plastics and what the root causes are for production, consumption, and disposal. The Clean Seas Campaign also works directly with governments. We establish uh, national and regional marine litter action plans and we help provide the technical guidance for governments to do so. And that includes uh, different types of ministries within that government. We pioneer national legislation and policies to promote marine litter reduction, and we set up national plastic management systems to help measure and reduce those plastic footprint. In the private sector, we are trying to have industries commit to reducing plastic use, production, product design, and packaging, and monitor and evaluate those actions towards reducing marine litter and microplastics. And finally, we try to work with civil society to reach a wider and more diverse audience through digital and social channels. We're also looking to register individual commitments to the action. As we mentioned, we were asking individuals to pledge to the campaign and also encourage national movements to become one, legal, one globally recognized brand. And this is where your sporting organizations and athletes come into play. So why sport? As all of you are aware, sport has the power to inspire, engage, and set new trends globally. With an audience of billions of participants and fans across the world, its reach is unparalleled. Sport has the ability to build connection, community, and culture, but it also has the ability to spur innovation and entrepreneurialism through collective moments of success and even failure. This is the unique value proposition and competitive advantage that sport brings, that it can bring to raising awareness and mobilizing global action to address this triple planetary crisis, and this is pollution included. So plastic is truly a problem in the sport industry. Thousands or even millions of plastic bottles may be used and thrown away at large sporting events. But we're not just talking about plastic bags and plastic bottles. We're talking about merchandise, athlete, athlete wear, athleisure wear, uniforms, the astroturf that the athletes play on, um, ticket sales, signage, you name it, it all has plastic in it. So what can sport organizations focus on? Well, there's four direct outcomes that we can do to enhance the circularity in the way that plastics are used and kept in the economy. We can reduce the overall amount of plastic used in problematic uses, so single use and hard to recycle products. And what we're trying to do is significantly reduce the volume to make those, the volume of the plastics produced. And in order to do so, we need a 10% reduction in new production of the most problematic plastic products by 2027. 
We're also trying to enhance the circularity of the plastics in the economy, meaning we need to ensure that the recyclability is in practice and at scale is allowable in the geographies that they are eventually sold. So that it means to improve the waste management systems of all developing countries and also in the global north. And then we also need to ensure that loops are closed at the end of life. So this essentially means to consider the informal waste pickers that are in your country in the process of closing and modernizing the dump sites and landfills. And finally, it's to address the existing pollution in the environment, so any sort of legacy product, plastics. We're looking for a watershed moment in 2024. There's already a lot of momentum in transitioning to circularity and phasing out single-use plastics, and some sectors are already well ahead, and others are working to catch up. But eventually, everyone will need to transition and have greener credentials. So build up to 2024 is critical particularly for the UN in trying to pass this plastics treaty. If the sport industry is not part of this movement, because there is so much collective action that this industry can bring, everyone will end up being left behind. There is such an urgency now to shift to a circular plastic economy. And this is to reduce the volume of plastics entering our ocean by 80% by 2024 or 2040, reduce virgin plastic production by 55%, this will save governments $70 billion by 2040. It'll reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 25%. And in some nations in the global south, this can create 700,000 additional jobs. So today, we're really pledging for all of your sport organizations, all of the NOCs, to join the Clean Seas campaign and our mission to turn the tide and beat plastic pollution. So thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, it's a great step from the scale of Canada to the global scale. And, um, you know, it's very, very impressive the way um, you've actually transitioned from a local problem of plastic on the beaches that we all recognize and that we've all been involved in plastic, uh, you know, cl cleanups on the beaches to actually a brand new global framework for plastic, uh, for, for plastic, and I think that's worth another round of applause for the UNFCCC. Thank you very much. I might just open it up a little bit now to the floor. We've got a little bit of time left, um, but I do have a question back to Tricia, actually, because it's, it really comes back to maybe how we live in, in the sort of the very developed nations. I'm going to take the advantage because we also live in Canada. Uh, and so I'm just going to maybe start this round of questions up with the kind of question really around modern consumerism. Mm. And, um, you know, so the influence our sport carries it also is a responsibility and also an opportunity. So how can we as sports organizations, uh, you know, take this message from uh, Stephanie and consider our materials, the products, the services we use, both as a sport, but also what we are promoting, for better or for worse, that our fans and followers should be purchasing. How do you know? How would this, uh, you know? How do we? How do we process that as an NOC? Mm. Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, as I talked about, we have this two-prong approach. You're, you're dealing with the issues within your own organization, so that's fine, but nobody really knows about that. And that's why the second prong of our approach, um, working with our athletes who really have that platform, especially in Canada, our athletes are well-known, and I'm sure it's the same in your countries, uh, probably the most influential group of people in, their, in our countries. So. Partnering, partnering with our athletes so that people can see how they're changing their approach. I think that's, that's our superpower. Um, yeah, spot on. I mean, I think when people ask me what is the one key takeaway, if I was to do one thing, whether it's an individual, a family, small organization within a big business, it's sustainable sourcing. It's being, con it's being mindful of when you pull out a dollar or a euro, you're voting, you're saying, I want that product, I agree how you made it, how you packaged it, who made it, what materials are used, what end of life plan is there, how you shipped it to me and what packaging is included. So I think really sustainable sourcing 
is a great starting point for anyone in the room. Um, Leonardo, we just talked about superpowers. Um, if you, I mean, from you know African island nation, what's the you know what's your superpower, and wh how do you want to you know you you had a great range of programs there, but what's the next big challenge that you have in Cape Verde, and and uh, how are you going to tackle it? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, uh, we are surrounded by water. Uh, actually. It means we are connected to everyone. So this our superpower is our intent to connect to everybody in the world and try to get knowledge uh, shared. And every time that uh, we try to learn a little bit uh, and try to connect to other, to other partners, we give a step forward. So I'm, I'm just privileged to be around you guys. I just learned a lot with the presentation that uh, were made of, over here. If, uh, listening to the mentor of mentors, that's, that's, that's a, a very big, uh, 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 it's a, a, a very big and important uh, uh, moment for, for us to be sharing among ourselves over here. And uh, this, I think this is our superpower, to be able to uh, exchange knowledge with others, and to be able to, and don't think, uh, don't, uh, actually don't be compromised thinking that for being a small island nation, we are not capable of uh, having uh, uh, something to, to give uh, when we are trying to, to get some. There's an inherent culture of resilience, which yeah. is part of the culture, right? That's so, so that's, yeah, uh, that's learned, something to fall back on. I learn a lot right? with that's Brazil as well, point, that's right? it. So this, this I could nominate as our superpower and, and have keeping keep us uh, moving forward. Um, I believe this, this uh, to, be, to be what we can uh, point out. Um, we can maybe just throw it out to the floor for one or two questions. Is there anyone who would like to uh, participate? Or any, um, sir, hi. Bonjour à tous. Bonjour. Good morning to all. I too come from an island from Sao Tome and Principe. I have listened very carefully to the three presentations and this gives me food for thought. And I wonder about the conclusion. Well, the conclusion is that is that we, human beings, have changed the climate. And now, again, it's up to us to make sure that the conditions are created so that the climate can again become the climate that we want. And it definitely is a challenge. It's a challenge for all of us NOCs. So maybe between today and when we meet again in Bali next year, it is up to us, it's our responsibility to undertake at least one activity to protect the climate and to not let it deteriorate even more. And then we should get together again in Bali to see whether we can measure in percentage our contribution because we are all working for sport and what sport can do to improve the situation. I think that is the challenge that we have to assume. Let all of us organize just one activity to protect the climate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Really great example because when we think about climate change or tackling sustainability, we're thinking about mitigating risks, mitigating impacts, reductions. But within our own organizations, we're quite limited because our operations define a certain scope, uh, and that's what we typically work within. But the next step really is to look for opportunities to invest beyond our immediate operations within the value chain and look for opportunities to draw down more carbon, to reinvest, to try to make the size of our pizza smaller, basically. Um, and you know, some great examples of cross-sectoral, cross-organizational opportunities to decarbonize, whether 
We're coming from an island nation and we're, we're supporting another program in another country, but it's related to our value chain. But you, of course, are one big community. We're a global community. And so the opportunities and the matrix here is endless. And I think we'll probably finish on that message. It's a really, really good point. Merci beaucoup. Um, I'd just like to thank very much to all of the panel. Oh, we've got one more question. Seems like we've got a bit more time as well. Thank you. Oui, merci. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to thank ANOC for this innovation because this is the first time that we are able to attend a session which is more educational after having sat through a meeting where we receive a lot of information. We have perhaps not had enough time to go into the depth of the subjects, but I'd like to thank the speakers here for their presentations. I am convinced that if we are inspired by the Olympic values, the sport can convey a good strategy which should help us to respect these values. Education, I actually worked for the Canadian Wildlife Federation as their education manager for six years. Uh, and so we often hear when we talk about sustainability, the next generation, we need to educate them, they'll sort it out. And that's right, we, we do need to educate them but it's a cop-out at a certain level. We need to start by educating ourselves and to taking responsibility for our actions now. So I think that's a great point to conclude on. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much to the three panelists. And I have a, may we give them a round of applause? Thank you very much. Can I, um, can I finish with one small, one, for one small scale, Madam Lindbergh? Yes, thank you. So, in true Irish tradition, I'll give you one final story just to uh, end the event. Um, I think what's clear to us is that this is a common route for all of us, uh, but it's unique to every one of us. Um, it's a journey that's a little bit like planting a tree. The best time to do it was 50 years ago. The next best time to do it is now. And so, as I left home to come here a few, a few days ago with my daughter's um, notes still in, my, still in my mind, it was blowing a full autumn gale in Southwest Ireland, and I, we took off at the local airport. But by the time we landed in Dublin, it didn't look like that landing was going to go very well. And sure enough, just before we landed, the pilot aborted, and we took back off again. I'm sure we've all experienced that. And as we were going up around to come back in, and we finally did land, um, I kind of thought about you know, what that pilot and his co-pilot would have gone through. The reanalyzing re the situation, saying, this isn't working, we're going in the wrong direction, taking it out of autopilot, or however they fly those planes, and making a conscious decision to get back, uh, back uh, to change course. It seems to me that this is what we need to do now. We need to get out of autopilot mode. We need to put our hands back on the steering wheel. We need to make some clear, bold, and very specific decisions. We need to make some hard actions. And it's not going to be easy. But um, you're all Olympians. And you're all brave and bold. And I think our children's children and your children's children expect you to be superheroes. So thank you very much and enjoy the next session. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I want to thank uh, Damian and Trisha and Leonardo and Stephanie and I think it was very interesting and I think you came with a very good idea that uh, in Bali next year we will see what we have learned and uh, we really have to take uh, this 
also back to Enoch and see how we can help you together with the, with the IUC. So thank you very much. Applaud again for me. <laughs> And that brings us to the second session of the day, which is uh, sustainability in sport. Sus no, sorry. I'm doing like I said, Alejandro Blanco, I'm reading twice. No, sport integrity, and uh, sport integrity is a wide topic. What is sport integrity? It includes a lot of things and uh, I think we are ready with Michael Chambers because you are also our our. Uh, no? Ah, oh, we have a coffee break. You haven't written that on my screen. It's a coffee break. <laughs> Sorry. So at 11.30, we start with session two. So enjoy the coffee break. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>
Okay, no, not to lose uh, any time, we will start with the next session. I hope the coffee was good. I'm sorry, I almost forget to give you a coffee, but now we're all bright and ready to think again. So the next session is uh, how to protect integrity in sport. It's actually a very big topic with different angles and uh, we will listen to uh, what our panelists then have to tell us. As moderator and keynote speaker we have Mike Chambers who is the chair of the Enoch Legal Commission and is our representative in IPEX. Then the panelists, uh, we have uh, Anneke van Zanen Nieberg, president of the Netherlands Olympic Committee and Sports Federation. Is that right, Anneke? Yeah. We have, um, we have João Paulo Almeida, general director of the NOC of Portugal. And, and we have Matt Carroll, who is the CEO of the NOC of Australia. So, Mike, I give you the microphone here. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Ganilla. The clock over there. Um, just waiting for my PowerPoint to come up. There it is. Um, today, we hope that you'll go away from today's session with a bit more awareness of this issue, match fixing and it, the insidiousness of it within the background of sport than you had before you came in. We're going to be really with an hour. You've heard of the tip of the iceberg? We're going to be giving you a tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg, and you'll hear why I'm saying that in just a moment or so. Corruption, the most detestable of unethical behaviors, that's how I describe it. And in the sport context, it's the antithesis of fair play. It finds its way onto the field to play, and of course, we are all well aware of its persistent presence off the field of pay. In our world, the Olympic world, it encompasses all that undermines the Olympic values and the Olympic Charter's fundamental principles of Olympism. Corruption is, at its core, the abuse or misuse of one's position and power, whether that's as an athlete or as an official, or as a member of the entourage. It is the absence of integrity. Integrity, at its core, is a simple concept. Doing what is right, no matter the forces or circumstances that weigh against that. It's about being honest with oneself and being honest with others. The UN ODC, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, speaks of corruption as something that undermines the very foundation of democratic institutions and perverts the rule of law. We, the National Olympic Committees, are democratic institutions and we're governed by the rule of law. We, the NOCs, owe it to ourselves and to our members and participants, and of course, in particular, our athletes, to do all that we can to possibly stand up to and stand in the way of corruption making its way into the walls of our NOC. Today we will discuss some of the tools available to you that may help you in recognizing corruption. It seeks to come in secretly. And some of the tools available to you that may help you prevent corruption from snaking its way into your organization. Corruption comes, of course, in many forms. Doping, harassment, bullying, sexual exploitation, physical abuse, match-fixing and match-manipulation, which we'll be talking about today, bribery, fraud, diversion of resources. The list goes on. We'll be talking about the tip of the tip of the iceberg of one of those types of corruption. The breadth and scope of this topic is, is, is of such an un, almost unimaginable size that today we will, as I just mentioned, have the opportunity to just speak of a little bit of part of one of its elements. So what can NOCs do about it? What should we as NOCs be doing about it? 
First and foremost, we must all recognize that none of our organizations are immune, immune to the creep of corruption. Taking the attitude that it won't happen to my organization, it can't happen to my organization, is not going to cut it. Don't leave yourself vulnerable. Don't comfort yourself with the thought, I'm not corrupt. I'm a person of integrity, and I'm the leader of my organization. So my organization needs to, needs to do nothing about corruption to prevent its entry. Rather, you have to take the necessary steps to ensure that your organization is the kind of organization where corruption will never secure a foothold, no matter who is at the helm, your or your successor or the successor to your successor, and so on. Corruption, like water, looks for the smallest crack to gain entry. And if it finds a crack, it gains entry. Corruption is a blight, unfortunately, experienced across all of society and in all regions of the world. Like a weed, it just keeps popping up, no matter how much weeding of your garden that you do. But you've got to keep weeding the garden, or your flowers will not grow. In fact, in the craziest of places it shows up, who would have thought that fishing contests would be corrupt? Well, just a couple of weeks ago, in what, at a fishing contest in one of the Great Lakes in North America, Lake Erie, uh, the quote-unquote gold medal winners, just as they were to be handed their gold medal, it was found out that they had inserted lead weights in the stomachs of the fish they caught in order to have the most weight of fish for the day. Believe it or not. Certainly in sport, corrupt prop practices have been, going, have been around for a long time, and of course they are in the ancient Olympics. We've all read the stories about the, uh, the, the bribery and match fixing that was going on in the ancient Olympics. And indeed, you know, thank goodness we've kept it out of our Olympics and the modern Olympics. But the Ukrainian author General Alexei Batosky, in a book he wrote, uh, writes of having heard of rumors of betting at the inaugural games in 1896. Rumors, unsubstantiated, but rumors nevertheless. The late former president of the International Olympic Committee, Jacques Rogge, said just over 10 years ago, I quote, now there is a new danger coming up that almost all countries have been affected by, and that is corruption, match fixing and illegal gambling. This is the new fight and we have to confront it. Indeed, President Rogge described illegal betting and its concomitant match-fixing and various permutations, spot-fixing, for example, as serious a threat to sports as doping. Current President Thomas Bach has rightly identified match-fixing and all its forms as the greatest threat to the integrity of the Olympic Games. It is indeed the greatest threat to the integrity of all of sport. If you take the Any Given Sunday, alluding to the Hollywood film uh, produced and directed by um, Oliver Stone and starring Al Pacino out of sport, the stadia will soon be empty. If it's fixed, why watch it? Well, it's not fixed, and it's our job as part of a team effort to ensure that it remains not fixed. The amount Listen to these figures. The amount wagered on illegal betting in any given year is estimated to be somewhere, and this is how clandestine it is, and this is how in pre, unprecise, rather, that those who are fighting it at the um, criminal justice level can have to be because it's so unknown. The amount that's bet and wagered on illegal betting each year is somewhere between $340 billion and $1.7 trillion. And they don't do it in your face. They do it behind your backs in the dark dressing rooms um, of under the stadium. The proliferation and ubiquity of global multi-jurisdictional online betting and the use of cryptocurrencies and their untraceability greatly exacerbates the problem. As NOCs, we need to be aware of the risks and do what we can to play our part in minimizing those risks. Self-awareness, 
basic in-house regulation, you'll hear something about that in a few moments, education, cooperation with governments <coughs> and law enforcement authorities, the establishment of national platforms for information exchange and cooperative response are just some of the initiatives, initiatives we need to consider in standing up and standing in the way of match fixing. Match fixing involves on the field of play corruption, not exclusively, but without the fix on the field of play, there can be no fix. Another, what we, what we must do as officials off the field of play is do our part to ensure that the fix on the field of play doesn't take place. We expect our athletes to play by the rules and impose a form of strict liability upon them when it comes to doping another corruption in sport, of course. So to we off the field officials responsible for the gov governance of sport equally must play by the rules. We must not betray the responsibility with which we have been entrusted. At the heart of the rules of conduct that we must adhere to, to stand up and stand in the way of corruption off the field of play is to act at all times with integrity. Integrity, I can't say that enough. The maintenance of one's integrity is always an antidote to corruption. Corruption has no attraction, no interest in an NOC that is governed top to bottom on principles of ensuring integrity in all that it does. Corruption survives in the absence of integrity. I ask that each of you please do not fall prey to the so often used excuse or false motivator, well, I'm doing what everybody else is doing, so I must be okay. We all have to take individual responsibility within our NOC to make our NOCs better. The NOC world is our world. It's ours to keep, it's ours to protect. It involves each NOC member and each Continental Association member of ANOC. What each one of us does, the way in which each one of us conducts ourselves, affects the other. Like it or not, corrupt behavior on the part of any one of us tarnishes and diminishes all of us. I'm sure all of you ex have experienced the outside of sport conversations which assume corruption throughout sport because of an isolated incident of corrupt behavior within sport. We must not let that happen. We must do our part to stand up and stand in the way of corruption. We, the NOCs and Continental Associations, must <clears throat> live the standard of Caesar's wife. Our conduct and the conduct of our NOC's affairs must be above suspicion. It must be rooted in, it must be laced with, and it must be sealed with integrity. Integrity is at the core of the fundamental principles of Olympism. Let's ensure that it, that it is and remains woven, woven into the fabric of each and every NOC and Continental Association of NOCs. We'll hear some speakers in a few moments, give us some ideas about how we might do that. Thank you very much for your attention and for this. And here we go. Our first speaker is, uh, who's given her time to be with us today, is Annika van Zanen-Nieberg, who is, the, as we mentioned, the president of the Netherlands Olympic Committee and has a, an illustrious career behind her in the field of auditing in the Netherlands and um, I'm sure knows all about risk management and as NOC president she'll share with us um, some of the risk management we can look at with respect to match fixing and how we keep it out of our NOCs and protect our athletes from getting and coaches and their entourages from getting caught up in it. Annika. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michael. And I think it's usually everybody close their eyes now. <laughs> yes, and then, and then we see the dark side of sports because I think we're talking about dark sides of sports. 
Yes, it's okay. It's okay. Yes. Uh, what I'll try to do is to give you a small insight of what we are doing in the Netherlands to combat and to make it sport safe and secure, and that we don't have any problems with infantry. And that's that's huge, because there are a lot of problems with integrity nowadays. For us, it's integrity is the backbone of sport. It's the backbone of Olympism. And if we cannot guarantee to our federations, to our athletes, that sport is completely integer, then we do fail on sport. And I think that will make sport less important in our society. So we have to be very strong. And match fixing is a part of the integrity approach of the Dutch NOC NSF. So we have the Olympic part, but also all the grassroots sports. Um, and I will try to focus a little bit on the, on the part of the match fixing, although integrity as like harassment is at this moment the biggest problem in the Netherlands. And we have a lot of issues, but it's a time that everybody speaks out and we have to make sure that athletes do feel safe in performing sport. And though match fixing, who in this room thinks that match fixing exists in their country? But there's still a few that do think that it's not in their country. And I think that's, that's strange because it's not something that happens only in your country, but it happens cross-border. So what we are trying to do is to do our best in the Netherlands, but if we are getting help from other countries, then I think it's oblivious. We won't uh, make sure that everything works as it should be. I give you an example. I was three weeks ago at a cricket match, and it was the Dutch team against the Pakistani. And I'm not saying anything about our, both our countries, if they are uh, in integral or not, but what happens there, there was a special officer for match fixing. And I said, at, at this place in, in Rotterdam, and, and but, but what happened, there was a time lag, there was a live video or live coverage of this match. And there was a time lag of 15 seconds between the play of field and the coverage in Pakistan. And what can happen is that players or people in the, the public can make a text to do the betting in Pakistan. So what the manager organized that all the players had to give in their cell phones up front of the match, up until an hour after the match. And they were looking at the, the traffic of texting on the tribune. But this, this is what happens. And for us, cricket is a small sport. And, but it, opens, it opened my eyes that it can happen in every sport, in every country. And it happens on a play of field in the Netherlands, in a small country, in a small place. But it goes cross-border. And we have to work together to get it done. But this is just only an example. So when we are working on integrity within our NOC NSF, then we think our responsibility is to create a system within the Netherlands where we can ass assure every athlete, if it's elite or if it's grassroots, that they can do sport in a safe and secure environment. And to do so, I come, we have a model. Our model regulations were based on recommendations of the IOC and also rules that our professional national football federation already implemented. Uh, they are in line with the Olympic Movement Code on the prevention of the manipulation of competitions that was, port, uh, was published shortly. 
And what we do is that to obtain funding from the NOC, uh, all the sport federations who are member of our NOC NSF have to comply to the minimum requirements of our rules, of that are in our rules. The implementation of disciplinary law on sexual harassment and good governance were already in our minimum requirements. And in 2017, the implementation of disciplinary law on match fixing is added to that list. So federations have to prove every year that they comply with these minimum requirements. They have to show us that they adopted rules on match fixing or they have to explain why they didn't already do so. And this can have precautions on their funding. We have one, and it says on the, on the slide, that in the Netherlands, match fixing as such is not prohibited by law. Seems strange, but it's not prohibited. Uh, but in many cases of match fixing, they, the match fixing as such contain elements which are criminal offenses. And therefore, the police is always first in deciding whether or not to investigate a report done on match fixing. Most issues of matching, match fixing also contain possible criminal offenses and therefore only a few match fixing signals are handled solely with the disciplinary law within the federations. So what do we do? It's a lot about prevention, awareness, creating awareness, uh, investigation and sanctioning. Um, prevention and awareness is very important. We organized sessions with talents and elite athletes on recognizing and preventing match fixing, but also to explain the rules. What's very important, a lot of athletes don't know the rules, so you have to explain them to them. And we also created an e-learning and short animation movie in which we communicate the basic integrity rules we have. And that's not only for the elite sports or athletes or federations, but it's also for the grassroots. And together with federations, we created campaign material which federations can use to raise awareness within their federation, within their clubs. And it is important for us, that's the, another part, if you are aware, then you have to create a place where people can raise their voice about suspicions, about worries, about signals, uh, or report on specific things of manipulation. They are everyone from recreational athletes to talents to elite athletes and staff can make use of our confidential hotline for advice on integrity issues. We have organized a special center of, for safe sports within our organizations of the NOC NSF. Uh, so people can report issues to them and they will handle them through. So in 2021, the Center for Safe Sport had over 600 contacts about misconduct. And most of these calls are about harassment and bullying. And we only received three on suspicious of max fishing. And we think that's only the top of the top of the everything that comes, the camel nose. And these reports are transferred immediately to the police. If it comes to match fixing, it goes to the police. And as NOC, we think it's very important that the police and other authorities are able to investigate criminal aspects of match fixing. But we also think it's important to be able to investigate and sanction within our own system of disciplinary law. After police or other authority are finished, or when a report evidently contains no possible criminal elements, we think it's important that a report is investigated by professionals, and therefore we set up a fact-finding committee and pool of prosecutors on match-fixing, doping and sexual harassment. All sports federations can call on this investigation committee to perform an investigation. And we, as a NOC NSF, support them with sufficient funding. So it cannot be said we cannot do this because we don't have the funding. We will support them. 
The committee and the pool of prosecutors are positioned at the Dutch Institute of Disciplinary Law in Sports. Over 60 of the 78 national federations are now member of this institute and have outsourced part of their disciplinary law to this institute. NOC NSF encourages other national federations to join them as well and help them to do so by fa facilitating the process of becoming a member of the institute. Another wholly separated part of the Dutch Institute of Discipline disciplinary law in sports is the disciplinary committee. By becoming a member of the ISR, as it's called, and national federations gives the disciplinary committee the powers to act as an independent judge in disciplinary law. This enhances the professionalism and independence in disciplinary law. So there is a lot of institutes that help us to make sure that it's all safe. But what brings the future for us? In the Netherlands, we keep develop, developing our approach to integrity and safety in sports. At this moment, our government is looking into the question whether match fixing should be a criminal offense as such. As NOC and NSF, we are much in favor of this. It should be made very clear that match fixing is unwanted, it's a threat to sports, and therefore should be illegal. Furthermore, the Dutch Parliament expressed several times the wish to transform the Center for Safe Sports, which now is in our organization, uh, to be a completely independent organization instead of being a part of us. And currently, the Minister of Sport is looking into this matter. From our perspective, it, we think it would be a good idea. But on the other hand, as long as it's in, within our juris jurisdiction, we can make sure it performs very well. Because sometimes things happen. We had some integrity with the gymnastics, and we, uh, it came out. And after that, a lot of people, a lot of athletes came out with their problems. And uh, it was harassment, and they told it to the center of safe sport. But there were so many calls that there had to be an increase of personnel. And if it was an independent organization, you have to wait for funding of the ministry to get more people involved. And it was now within our jurisdiction, and they report directly to me, not to anyone else in the organization. We could put in five extra people to help them out, to pick up the phone and to make the good and right decisions and to help those athletes. Continue. Last year, online betting became legal in the Netherlands. Almost immediately, we saw an enormous increase of high-risk bettings in sports. We think this is a high and new risk for our athletes. They are the ones vulnerable for manipulation, threats and blackmail, and we will do our utmost to protect them. So our organization for safe sport, our center for safe sport, has to be up to standard to, to deal with all those new threats. So this was a small insight. I have nine seconds left, I guess, or that's standing there for 10 minutes now. <laughs> uh, our battle uh, to max fiction continues. And we would like to hear how you cope with these challenges because we think that the battle cannot be won by us alone. We have to do this together. Um, and only when we do this together, we can ban match fixing or other dark sides of sport out of sports. And I hope that we can do this together in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Annika, and thank you for sharing with us some of the uh, initiatives you've begun and some of the challenges you still have in the Netherlands with respect to this very, very difficult issue to grab onto and get a hold of and throw to the ground, match fixing. And now we're going to hear from João Paulo Almeida, if I said that correctly. I hope I came close enough anyway. If there's an expert here on match fixing, the fight against match fixing, how to deal with it, it's this guy right here. He is the director general of the Portuguese... Um, Olympic, National Olympic Committee, and he's going to share his thoughts with him with us right now. Ciao.
Thank you, thank you, Matt, and congratulations for your very good Portuguese. It's hard to spell my name. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that said, and firstly, I want to commend the ANOC and Gunilla to move this issue from the underground over the ground so we can st start to scratch the tip of the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg. Uh, and you, you have said, wrapping up the previous session, the, that uh, the next one will be about sustainability. And you are not wrong. You are right. Because is the sustainability of sport, or the very fabric of sport, which is at stake while we are persisting to live on denial to the dimension of this problem. We have a huge elephant in the room. You have listened to the introductory remarks that Matt has shared with us about the, the mentioning of the former president of IOC, Jack Rogg, about the dimension of this problem. So, it is very important, this kind of event, so in order to NOCs start sharing practices one another and tackle this huge and global problem with a global solutions and a global approach. This is my uh, first remark. Second one, we usually tend to uh, guarding the lily over the, the programs, the actions that we have uh, in place very proudly, uh, sharing the deliverables and the outcome of our work. But unfortunately, in this area, while there is reputational damages, lives shattered, corruption, sexual harassment, high-profile cases, we cannot be proud, we cannot be happy. And I will share with you how a limited resource NOC, like the Portuguese one, has been addressing this uh, issue throughout the years since the inception of this uh, program back in 2015, to uh, not share how proud we are, but to share with you how long we have to start uh, digging uh, to move and how hard it is to move this problem underground from uh, over the ground. And so in a very action-oriented and pragmatic uh, uh, way because we NOCs, we are delivering work on the field and we need to have basic tools and basic instruments to start working and start uh, increase the capacity of our athletes to resist, to recognize and to report these kind of threats. So without further ado, I will share with you a short video about our integrity program how, and how uh, it has evolved. Unfortunately, with no sound. Ah, respect to win with honesty is always better than winning the ball. That's not what we want. We want to win well, we win with justice, and not looking for external factors to reach the victory, or success, or even money that can help us in our personal life. fenómeno que, que, que afeta o desporto pelo lado negativo, já com muito peso em modalidades muito grandes e isso provavelmente ou certamente irá alastrar-se às modalidades mais pequenas como é, como é a nossa, que não tem tanto, tanto impacto mundial. Focar em saber reconhecer este fenómeno com vídeos temáticos de quem passou por isso, saber resistir e dizer que não e saber reportar estes três erros são essenciais para confinar uma mensagem que temos que transmitir de uma forma muito sumária e muito orientada para a ação junto dos atletas, nomeadamente os mais novos.
So how we start moving from a reactive approach to a preventive approach? Or if you want to use a sustainability uh, stance, how we start uh, move to taking care of the forest rather than fire, uh, fighting the fire. This is what is uh, at stake uh, over here. So we can move on. Oh, I think it's here. We work in a three-pillar approach as the IOC recommended. First and foremost, the pillar one where we have more autonomy to deliver, awareness, prevention, education, training and capacity building. Second one, regulation. We work hand in hand with our national federations so they can amend their regulations according to the Olympic Movement Code on the Manipulation of Sports Competitions. And we work together with the government to update the Portuguese legislation to be compliant with uh, international guidelines notably the Council of Europe Convention on the Manipulation of Sports Competition, also known as Macaran Convention. Third, and very important, information sharing, cooperation with a wide array of uh, stakeholders. So, how we have uh, done this? First, we uh, trained a couple of ambassadors, those who are uh, up there, athletes, who deliver and pass this, uh, this message. And we trained the so-called single points of contact, the SPOCs. We have 44 federations with people, officers trained to uh, start working as gate openers so the NOC can work hand in hand with the, the federations. We have delivered uh, over uh, 100 training sessions, working with 20 national associations, uh, with more than uh, 3,500 participants. We have delivered this in a customized way to athletes from grassroots to elite level, coaches, officials, our Olympic uh, missions, parents, and also students. We devise a wide array of educational content, either in Portuguese or in English, uh, a handbook with a roadmap for a stepwise approach so the national federations and our members can start tackle this uh, in a comprehensive uh, manner. Educational contents, all that available uh, in our website. We have delivered, then this is quite important because when you start working on this field you will face lots of doors shut people saying and living on denial to this saying they have no time uh, there is a very sensitive issue and all sort of excuses and so it is very important you have resolve and you have uh, resilience to, to hear lots of no's and still uh, find a way to, to deliver. And that's what we have, we have done. We, we cover all uh, the Portuguese uh, country delivering free of charge these training uh, uh, sessions, being at work hours, uh, weekends, uh, whatever. If we find a slot of five minutes to deliver, we go there. And uh, we work this uh, in a network approach. With the, the first, we have an integrity officer, and as I said, we are uh, a small NOC. Our uh, integrity officer does other issues uh, within our NOC, and so. It is not, she is not fully dedicated to the issues of integrity. And we work end in end with our, our uh, Olympic Athletes Commission. It's very important that whenever you have the possibility, you have an athlete to go with you to deliver the training sessions because uh, they are seen as role models and the other, their peers can better hear and understand what they are uh, saying. Very important work with the IOC Olympic Movement Unit on the prevention of competition manipulation. I encourage you to come to, to Niels. I'm seeing him uh, over there. 
to uh, start working with the IOC uh, integrity so they can share uh, with your NOC the contents that the, the, Olymp the International Olympic Committee has devised uh, on, this, uh, on this area. And last but not uh, the least, we work with the NOC sports, uh, the, our NOC sports department. Because as I said at the beginning, the first step is to acknowledge the dimension of the problem. And it all starts within your, uh, your organization. It was hard for us uh, to have a slot in our Olympic mission uh, meetings to uh, deliver training sessions and start uh, talking about the, this issue. We, we, we had to persuade our colleagues within the DNOC to start working uh, on this area. So you can imagine the layers of layers of layers that we need to overcome to tackle this, uh, this, this issue. And I see I am running out of time, Gustavo. I wrap it up how we work um, in a global uh, basis uh, on this field. First, cooperation with national authorities, being the law enforcement, but other think tanks and uh, academic and research uh, institutions and bodies related to, to, to corruption and to prevention of corruption. International is very important. We have uh, a long-standing relation with the Council of Europe, with Interpol, with the UNODC, with Europol, and we achieve that using tools available by our continental association, notably these two projects. SIGS, where we start what we are doing here, sharing views with other fellow uh, NOCs and points, which was another Erasmus Plus project uh, addressed to uh, train and capacity building of the so-called single points of contacts. Lastly, very important, we have delivered sessions to fellow uh, Portuguese-speaking NOCs, Cape Verde is there, Guinea, and we have delivered uh, uh, a training session hand-in-hand -hand with Interpol and the IOC to the Portuguese sport speaking uh, uh, community. So we can start working this in a collaborative partnership uh, way. And just to, to wrap it up, we need to move forward and our next challenge is safeguarding sexual abuse and harassment. We have started working in 2020, uh, providing training uh, to three officers uh, uh, in this area, but there is a lot of work that we need to, to, to do to tackle uh, this threat. And so that's all uh, for me, and I'll be available to share uh, with you later on other views on this topic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. And, and what was particularly, uh, I think, important uh, in your message to all of us who are here today is no NOC is too small to be able to play a part in the fight against the big global problem of match fixing. And here's an example of an NOC with limited resources that took the problem in hand and is dealing with it. And importantly, I thought this was important, that you mentioned that it's important to include the athletes in the messaging. Because athletes believe athletes. And that's always the case. Now, we are going to ha have our last presenter, Matt Carroll, who is the CEO of the Australian Olympic Committee, who is going to bring, uh, and share, bring to us and share with us the experience with respect to match fixing and the fight against match fixing, of course, in Australia. Matt. Thanks very, thanks very much, and uh, it's a, uh, a pleasure to speak with you today because it is a conversation. This is not a, a speech, so to speak, so I'll try and avoid it. I think it sounds speech-like. I'm also doing my sustainability piece from the first time I got rid of paper, and I'm doing it electronically, so if I stop and falter, you know I use my fat fingers the wrong way. Um, this is the Australian experience, which is not necessarily applicable or will work 
in the countries uh, represented here in the room today. So it is very much, very much about that. Um, I'm going to cover a little bit more than match fixing yeah. because integrity is a very wide and diverse subject and some of the integrity issues are linked. So anti-doping is linked to match fixing. Anti-doping is often linked to corruption. And so you can't actually separate, separate the bits. But we've always had a strong focus and position on sport integrity. One of the first things that the AOC has always done is put it into our constitution. And we asked all our member sports to put it in their constitution. The reason for that is quite simple. You're making a commitment. If you don't make a commitment, you often don't get anything done. Because if you haven't got the commitment to get, and you can't read about it and enshrine it. So in our constitution, we say to take action against any form of discrimination and violence in sport, to adopt and implement the World Anti-Doping Code, to encourage and support measures relating to the medical care and health of athletes. Why the health of athletes? Mental health of athletes. Mental health athletes is important. That can be related back to corruption in sport when the, when the athlete isn't doing so well. To encourage and, and uh, to protect clean athletes and the integrity of sport by being a leading advocate against uh, doping uh, and taking action against all forms of manipulation and of competition and related corruption. That's enshrined in our, um, in our constitution and into the, uh, our member sports as well. In 2011, um, the uh, Australian federal and state governments agreed to a national policy on match fixing in sport, which included a commitment to provide support for monitoring irregular sports betting on international events, including the Olympic Games. But as previous speakers have said, it's not just the high-flying events such as the Olympic Games. There was corruption down in a volleyball match in regional Victoria, $75,000 has been transacted. Obviously, no one bets on volleyball matches in, in, uh, in regional Victoria, but that's, that's how low it can get down. There was a young guy who was about a fourth grade tennis player in Queensland who got caught up in match fixing as well, in the match fixing in the sport of tennis. So it's not always the top end of town, so to speak. And also, moving to other parts of integrity, things can come out of the, drop out of the sky on you. Um, in December 2017, the Australian government set up the Royal Commission into institutional responses to child sexual abuse and handed down their report. It didn't make for good reading in Australia. It was horrendous. Horrendous abuse had been committed against children. Institutional, why institutional? Because it was schools, it was institutional with religions, it was institutional with government organisations, it was institutional because it was sporting institutions as well. It investigated how governments could better protect children and how they can achieve best practice in reporting and respond, responding to incidents and, and how to address the impact of child sexual abuse. Uh, in response to the Royal Commission, um, this, they set up a scheme called the National Redress Scheme. And the purpose of that was to acknowledge that many children were sexually abused in Australian institutions, including sporting institutions. Um, it holds institutions accountable for this abuse and helps people who have experienced abuse to gain access to counselling and direct personal response and a redress payment. The AOC, we didn't, we'd looked back through our records, we checked and rechecked and checked again, we found nothing of ourselves, but importantly, we joined the scheme in 2019 as both as a responsibility, so that people could come forward if they had experienced sexual abuse under an Australian Olympic team, uh, and as a leadership of our member sports. And the leadership was needed because when the scheme was set up, it wasn't set up for sporting institutions in mind. So we worked with our government to ensure that sport could play a part. And why was that? It took time and effort, and you're quite right. I mean, OK, the Australian Olympic Committee is a reasonably resourced organisation. We're still only a staff of 40, which is probably a lot bigger than others in the room. So it took a lot of time and effort. But if we'd done nothing, sport would have been damaged and the victims would have gone without redress. In 2017, the Australian government also commissioned a review into Australia's sport integrity arrangements. And that review looked at a stronger response to match fixing, regulation of sports wagering. Australia has a, uh, a very large gambling habit, so they, need, they needed to do that. Enhancing Australia's anti-doping capability, a development of a national sports tribunal, which has only been going for about 18 months now, um, and the development of a national sports integrity commission, which is now known as Sport Integrity Australia. Um, as a result, as I said, those organisations were set up. So the Sport Integrity Australia is now our national anti-doping organisation. It's a national platform for information sharing and competition manipulation and works with obviously the, the uh, government agencies and security agencies in that space. But importantly, and it works with us in, uh, on this and with Paralympics Australia as well, uh, education and advice to assist you know, athletes, sports, officials, 
families, parents, uh, to understand the you know, prohibited substances and methods in sport, to understand that the abuse of children and other persons in the sporting environment, what can happen, and child safe policies in that area, manipulation of sporting competitions, and obviously, uh, importantly, failure to protect members of a sporting organisation from bullying, intimidation, discrimination or harassment. Um, so we continually, the AOC works very closely with Sport Integrity Australia, the, um, including developing a fully independent framework to deal with this abuse, intimidation and other safeguarding issues so that a person can feel comfortable, they can make a complaint, it's independent from the sport, it's independent from the Australian Olympic Committee. Um, and we've encouraged all our member sports to sign up, sign up to the, uh, the, the uh, Sports Tribunal to hear these sorts of complaints. Examples, Football Australia, one of the largest sports in the country, um, has established an independent complaint handling process for men's and women's national teams, the A-League and uh, the youth leagues, and women's artistic gymnastics in one particular state um, to ensure that all the sports programs for the children are child-focused and... Uh, uh, and safe, age appropriate. Uh, for Beijing 2022, we developed an e-learning tool with Sport Integrity for the athletes around anti-doping. Um, as I said, people, athletes don't read things, you just send them a document, we actually make sure it's all online and it's done in a presentational sense because probably like a lot of people, they don't read things, you just give them a document, they don't read it, so you've got to give them a, 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 a bit of a social media prompt on things. Um, and we're also uh, working with them to um, uh, develop an anti-match-fixing e-learning program as well. How match-fixing can ruin careers, as the previous speaker was, was, was talking about, and endanger lives, um, and how match-fixers target athletes uh, and officials and other people um, as a gateway to corruption. Um, development um, of the Australia Sports Wagering Scheme is underway. Uh, it's a national approach. Australia is a federation. Six states, two territories, and all do things a little bit differently. So we've got to get everyone around the table every now and then to ensure we get a, nas a national scheme. Um, and the point of that is to have sport integrity embedded within sport and wavering service providers, the betting agencies as well. Um, we've had discussions with the betting agencies, obviously around, around the Olympic Games, uh, around how they advertise, because we can't stop them advertising. Um, establishing the requirements for information on intelligent gathering, that's very important, because um, people who are... Cheats don't obviously want to be caught, so they're hiding, so they're not going, they're not going to tell you about it before it happens. And, and understand the integrity of the threat environment, um, so that both the athletes and, and families, importantly, can understand how it works, the, the dangers that are there, and it's not just something that, uh, that, that we're making up. Um, and we also have now, uh, with Sport Integrity Australia, um, our ambassadors uh, believe in sport is the tagline that goes with that. I guess. The most critical aspect of how we develop and manage this work is continuing, as I said, the continuing education of athletes, parents, sports, uh, strong collaboration with our Athletes Commission. We run all these things through our Athletes Commission. That's very important to have that conversation. This is a conversation. There's no point lecturing people. It just doesn't work. It is a conversation you need to have. The Athletes Commission, our Athletes Commission has similar conversations with the Athletes Commission, commissions of our national federations. Uh, so that's, that's an important aspect. Um, ensuring also that we're listening and learning the views of our sports, because they're, the, they're on the ground. We, between Olympic Games and the Pacific Games, we're not engaged as much with the athletes as the sports are. So we need to listen to the member sports to tell us what they're hearing on the ground, what their requirements are, what services they require, and then we can reflect that, advocate that to governments, to our uh, federal government and to our state governments. I suppose, and I said, I, I took up the theme yesterday that you know, there's a lot of things that you all in the room have to do to run your National Olympic Committees. Um, and managing sport integrity in all its forms is challenging, requires constant attention and awareness. Um, the aim, of course, is to be ahead of the game. Um, but we know we can't do everything, but doing nothing is not an option. Thanks for your time today. Thanks very much, Matt, and thanks for reminding us, of course, that corruption has many, as a vi just as the COVID virus has many variants, match fixing being one, and sexual abuse, and so many other incidents of abuse being another. And of course, as NOCs, we can give quarter to neither of them, or any of them. And um, we've, got to, we've got to be fighting against all of them.
Today we may be speaking about one or two, but all need our attention. Uh, we have um, a little bit of time. I, I just want to um, ask if anyone out there has any questions for any of our uh, panel or panelists. I can't see well with this very good light that is uh, shining in my eyes, but Andres, I'll ask you to provide anyone who wants to make a comment. Thank you very much, sir. Merci, uh, monsieur le modérateur. Well, for, the, cette session, for those who just arrived at this session, I don't think we can thank enough uh, the Secretary General Gunilla, who is indefatigable for the organization of this uh, session, which is the first in uh, the history of this organization. I think that this morning we were talking about sustainability and integrity in sport. And uh, we've learnt much. As you were saying, with regard to doping uh, issues, uh, this is something which is not in line with the Olympic spirit. But uh, I think that uh, pedagogy and education are key here. And that's the point that has been un underlined by the panelists. And that's why we need to, to fight against this scourge with uh, the greatest energy possible. The struggle for fair play is, is something which uh, takes on so much importance. And I think that the financial uh, elements involved in this uh, for competition should uh, not uh, allow us uh, to accept deviant uh, behavior. I think that these types of activities have uh, to be fought against. Having listened to this uh, session very carefully, I've been uh, wondering about the kind of practices we see in uh, golf and track and field. In track and field, as you probably know, uh, uh, there is a lot of payment uh, being paid to, to uh, the champions so that they give uh, greater visibility. Uh, it's uh, start money. And uh, prize money is also given uh, to uh, certain persons involved in these activities. Now, in order to pay people to improve records, is that a bonus? In golf. We've got exactly the same thing happening at the big tournaments. You've got champions who are brought along, they're paid, and they've got their prize money. Is that classed as being corruption in sport? Thank you. you want to, somebody wants to answer. You want to answer? After he answered. Anyone? Happy to answer that question. No. Sure, okay. Prize money is not corruption in sport. No. At all. And I think prize money has been around since time immemorial. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but it's the, how you manage your sport or the sports that you ensure that that corruption doesn't occur. Take the racing in the horse racing industry. They've had um, uh, prize money, uh, the horse, you know, people win, the jockeys get paid, but they have a very, very, very strong integrity space in, in horse racing. Why? Because what has happened in the past, where it has been race fixing, and it was going on for years, but, but they have a very strong integrity space for that. And we're talking about prize money in the millions. Um, so uh, prize money is, is part, of, part of sport, and it is, we have to accept that. And I think uh, an athlete who commits his or herself uh, for the long term into a sport and everyone's watching, um, well, yeah, they should be able to win, win prize money, which helps them continue to practice their sport. Uh, but we can do it with integrity. Go ahead, Annika. I, I, I don't think I don't, it's, it's on. I don't think that it, it's corruption if you have uh, money being paid for getting in a match. But what we see is that we deal with uh, medal bonuses in the Netherlands. So if you become one, two, or three then you get a medal bonus. You can say, well, that's, that's no match fixing, that's okay. But what you see is that people want to get the bonus. And they are willing to do a lot of things, coaches, athletes, to become Olympic medalists. And then we have to make sure 
that the process, process of becoming a star, becoming a medalist, becoming a superhero is still going the way we want us to do. Because we, we see at the, uh, the gymnast that was all about becoming better. Coaches that were forcing young girls to train too hard. To so they wanted to be come Olympic medalist. So you have to be aware that you ca if you can win prize money, I'd rather have starting money because then only being there gives you the right to get a payment. But if there is prize money at the end of the game, then you have to make sure that the process of being and becoming a medalist is very secured for the athletes and the coaches. Yes, ciao. Just, just just a very, a very short remark on what you said, because a different thing is when you can get a bonus for underperforming. And uh, when we are talking about it, we are talking about corruption. And even though there are some kind of sports where you can uh, somehow underperform and ultimately win the, the, the competition. And nowadays, there are a wide array of international and European federations with strong integrity unique, uh, units dealing not only with, with doping, as in the past, but with these issues that we are talking uh, uh, about here. Uh, be it manipulation of competitions, uh, corruption, or sexual harassment uh, and, uh, and abuse. And it's very important for you to encourage your athletes to come to those integrity uh, units whenever they have such kind of approaches to see what is corruption and what is not. Because sometimes there is a very, and a very narrow, thin line between both of these things. Absolutely. Thank you. Good. Oh, do we have any time, uh, Gnell? Oh, yeah. Sure. Is that your man? Right there, you know. uh, thank you, Mike. I think the presentation has been good, but there has been an element missing when one looks at the topic, how to protect integrity in sports. What I'm speaking about <coughs> is the temptation as regards young athletes when they see the way out from poverty or from the ghetto is to become involved in this. I would have liked to hear how you have fought this and what you have done in order to make those young athletes who are in poverty do not go to doping. I know you spoke about education, but give us the examples. Thank you. Okay. Who wants? I, I think it's... Uh... Annika, do you want to... A, um, Matt, go ahead, Matt. It's a, you're 100% correct. It is an issue, but it's one of those, it's a temptation like any other temptation. And so I think, to answer your question, there's an education, not just to the young athlete, but an education of the family. I mean, the only, and obviously I appreciate I'm talking from a, a, a country which is wealthy, so it's a, bit, a little bit different, but there are places in Australia where, yes, you're right, it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's an opportunity to get out of that, that particular um, socio-economic position the family's in. So it is an education piece, and that's what we do, uh, particularly in our Indigenous communities, is what we do is an education piece, um, and with the family as well. I mean, the, with the world, the, the sport of football, I know Australian parents who will send their child to all the camps in Europe, spend horrendous sums of money, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000, just to see if their child can get through, because it's their child who might get paid, who might actually make more money for the family. Um, so it is an education piece. But you're never going to stamp out everything because, I'm sorry, you know, there's always going to be human beings who don't want to follow the rules. If I, could, if I could just say, your man, even people in poverty can possess integrity. Mm. And just because they're living in impoverished circumstances doesn't mean that they can't be imbued with integrity and say no. And I'll live with the circumstance I have and I'll try to better myself, but I'm not going to breach my integrity, my home personal integrity. Another question uh, behind you, man, there? Don't know who has the mic. Oh, over here. Got Good. Well, me escuchan. Felicito la organización. I would like uh, to congratulate uh, the organization for the uh, organizing of this uh, very productive uh, forum. I'm sorry, I'm going to speak in Spanish. 
Now, I have a big question for the Olympic committees, the National Olympic committees, that is. If there is no law which uh, officially bans uh, these uh, types of activities, how can the national um, committees uh, do something uh, with regard uh, to these uh, activities of the league? So that's uh, my first question. The second uh, question concerns money. When you've got national leagues, for example, there are announcements uh, that uh, teams are not playing uh, to uh, win in order to not improve uh, their standing or classification in the, the season. How can we analyze that? And I believe uh, that we've got to see how you can uh, find a form to deal with this. Uh, there is uh, uh, a lot of uh, activities in our national committees, uh, but we have national leagues in our, uh, many of our countries, and uh, we've got to make sure that these sporting activities are clean. Ciao. Yep. Yep. Uh, I will try to, to build the, the, the bridge between uh, both questions uh, in, uh, in English. Um, the, the only place where the word success comes before the word uh, work is in the dictionary. What that means is even if you don't have resource, if you go to a shortcut, a setting, a bribe, your sport career will be jeopardized forever because you can serve time, you can pay a fine, but your reputation is tarnished forever. And we have examples in the world of sport when it comes to that. So I fully agree with Matt. Even if you have resources or not, once you engage in this kind of approaches, and sometimes they are quite sedative, you are jeopardizing your career uh, forever. Regarding the second issue, even if your country doesn't have uh, legal provisions and specific criminal provisions on the manipulation of sports competitions, there is the other area, the sport disciplinary provisions. Mm -hmm. And all international federations from the Olympic program are obliged to abide by the Olympic Movement Code on the manipulation of sports competitions as uh, pursuant the Olympic Charter. And so the, nation, the, the, the continental associations and the national uh, associations are obliged to, and that's the reason why we work hand in hand with our national uh, federations to tackle this, uh, this issue. What that means? That means that probably you cannot be sanctioned by your court because there is no legal provision for manipulation of sports, uh, of sports competition, but for sure you will be uh, prosecuted by uh, your international federation, your continental uh, federations for violation of provisions of sport disciplinary codes on the manipulation of sports competitions. Thank you. Annika, do you want to add something? Yes, and as I try to explain in my speech, it's like we start with the regulations from the if we try to build a system as NOC for the national federations and, as, and in those rules we apply uh, rules about uh, match fixing, good governance and all the national federation has to apply to those rules and if you don't apply then we can stop funding but we can also say you are no longer part of the Olympic family because this is the basis on which we try to do sports with the Olympic values as bottom line. So they have to apply or explain why they don't fulfill the rules that we make by ourselves. So that's what you can do. In the second part, I think the answer was pretty clear <laughs> from my neighbor. Do you can take questions? Okay, Gunila, I, I just want to, I just want to sure. say a few words, which was not covered. Uh, myself and uh, my president, we are heavily involved in cricket. Since the uh, president of Dutch Olympic Committee talk about cricket, yeah. we thought of just sharing with you some other things not covered here. Yeah. Especially, uh, Mr. Chambers, we are talking about match fixing, betting. All these things are nice. All these things have been done now. But the new way of doing is, 
they have gone into one step further ahead is the uh, the selection of the team and the selectors and associate with the manager so you have to be mindful of that i will get my president to say a few words because he was fighting against all these thing in sri lanka okay. um mike chambers thank you very much as you say is a tip of the iceberg but i don't want to go deep if we all are hungry <laughs> very importantly and not one of their next session if they could educate all of us how this is done a lot of us are not aware how the match fixing or thing uh, or betting is done mm -hmm. just to let you know madam manaka mm -hmm. the match you spoke about there are two aspect one is the legal betting yes. and one is the illegal betting what you mention may be a legal betting but the illegal betting is the worst thing where the betting company get the players involved yeah. that is detrimental mm -hmm. so i have been doing lot of work on this i am yeah. happy to talk longer but i don't can want I to say? do that so the important is the illegal betting can i respond to this because it's always difficult if you mention uh, an example it's always the wrong example because i think the pakistani is a fantastic team and i think they do their utmost to do things but it was an example to let people know that you can play a match in the netherlands and you have to be aware that there can th happen things in in the other part of the world so I it was not, not because that. i want to say pakistani are corrupt no, no, no. or anything Definitely because that not, was the wrong you have to mindful of the okay. illegal betting and also some of the international federation are tied up with betting companies for sponsorship yes. you go on the google you will notice the number of international federations who are tied up yes thank you Thank you very much. Here. All right, thank you. And I want to thank all the panelists for their contributions this morning. And they focused very much on the the performance issues and and how those end up um lacking integrity and in some then the well i would say the activity maybe by spectators and people off the field in terms of things like the betting and 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 so on one of the things i would like to hear you speak to is the things that concern us here directly in the room you did not speak to governance type issues because i believe we have to talk to the things that starts with us and over time we know we have had issues and and i won't i won't try to make any specific examples but we have had issues to do with um the bidding process mm -hmm. processes for games and so on mm -hmm. we've had fairly current examples of um some of our colleagues who end up in criminal proceedings after things like that you get all sorts of allegations about um how do i get elected yeah sure and about our own elections yeah, that's, and yeah, and that's and, and so on topic. and i want to suggest and those of us who have been around sport long enough we know that eventually what manifests down on the playing field really starts in this room mm -hmm. so how do we it, address the integrity among ourselves and our own behaviors that's where it starts could you could somebody speak to that can i i'll uh, i i'm going i'm going to ask our secretary general to speak to that but if i could just first please direct you to the ipax website which provides a, a lot of information on governance and tools and guidance you can use to improve your governance to try to ensure that corruption doesn't make its way into your organization but you know no thank you sir i think you just uh, raised some topics for the next seminar like we had in the previous uh, session about the sustainability and we will meet in bali and we can have a continuation of questions that uh, you want to raise because now we have only had one hour for a general debate and as i said from the beginning these topics are so wide yeah. 
so you can't cover them in a very short time, but thank you mu very much for proposing that so we can bring it to the next seminar and uh, after this seminar we will send you a questionnaire and see which topics will uh, do you want for the future uh, but we will not have parallel session we will continue with this format so everyone can attend all the, the sessions so maybe three at a time and maybe in Bali we can have a full day for for this kind of seminars because I think uh, maybe these are more important than some of our reports but we need the reports but we all also need this discussion so mm -hmm. uh, with this I can't see any more hands uh, <laughs> so I, I would like to uh, thank our superheroes <laughs> up here up there. My, <laughs> and there all of you with Mike, Annick, and uh, Jopalo and, and Matt. And uh, thank you, and as I said, this was the first uh, real try with these uh, special sessions and discussions. And as far I, as I understand, and I think myself, I learned a lot. We will continue at the next General Assembly, and we will see what we can do better, but also take your proposals uh, with us. So thank you very much. Um, maybe where's, where's, we, where's lunch? People want to probably know. You only want coffee and lunch, right? <laughs> <laughs> I just think these people want to know where to go. The lunch is in the brasserie. Uh, uh, it's the same place where the breakfast is. At 2.30. 1.30. Until 2.30, okay. So you have a little more than one hour to have lunch, but um, maybe we should have a photo. Sure. Yeah. Let's have a photo. Let's have a photo. And also, uh, the previous panel, I don't know if you're still in the room. I think Trish took off. Trish took off. Yeah, I and, saw her go. Uh, Stephanie. Anyway, the ones who are in the room, please join on the stage. And thank you for attending after two full days before. Very interesting.